online. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to do the talk 2000 Years of Virgin, as you can see. And um, it was put together by Fatty. Uh, Fatty is a person who's previously done talks with us at the Bible Project back at Our Lady of Lebanon. Um, and he's gone a long way since then because he was really good back then. Now he's <laughs> awesome. He's got to blow your socks off. No pressure. No pressure. No. Um, so Fatty will be presenting tonight. I'm going to hand you over to him. Um, same as normal, if you've got any questions, um, please hold until the question slide. If it's really pressing and you've totally missed it, don't hold back. Then, then just jump in, ask the question, um, and we'll see if we can help you through it, get you the answer. Um, outside of that, welcome, Fatty. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, Shall we start with the prayer? <laughs> Can we all be upstanding in this Houston? It's not working anymore. One second. <clears throat> Please don't do that. Okay. that yes, it's working now. Thank you, God. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll pray the prayer of St. Ephraim. O Immaculate and Holy, Pure Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Queen of the world, hope of those who are in despair. You are the joy of the saints. You are the peacemaker between sinners and God. You are the advocate of the abandoned, the secure haven of those who are in the sea of the world. You are the consolation of the world, the ransom of slaves, the comfortress of the afflicted. I salute you, O great mediatress of peace between men and God, mother of Jesus, our Lord, who is the love of all men and of God, to whom be honor and benediction the Father and the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Can I just confirm for those on Zoom, is there any children on for listening as well? There's no, no. Kids? Cool. Because I'm going to say sex a lot today. So <laughs> let's not uh, let's be adults about it. Let's make sure there's no children. Um, but the talk is today is about Mary being the ever virgin, which means Mary was a virgin her whole life. Okay. And the sources that we use for the talk, of course, the Bible and the Catechism, um, a lot of church fathers, I won't name them all here, and a couple of books by Robert Haddad, uh, Defend the Faith, and Tim Staples, Behold Your Mother. Okay, so they're the sources we used. All right, the scope. So first, we'll look at, you know, what is the actual Catholic teaching on Mary being the ever virgin? So when we say, when the church says that, what does the church actually mean? Um, I even found out some new things when I was researching this topic, so I'm, I'm sure you can pick up some new stuff today. And secondly, what are some common arguments um, against the church's teaching and how do we deal with them? Okay. Before we get into the media info, you know, why do we think this topic is important to even, you know, learn about and know about? I remember in primary school, even I was told by my primary school Catholic teacher that you know, she, there's a possibility she did have kids. So I think there's yep. a lot of confusion around the topic. So I think it's good for us to know yeah, the right. church is teaching. Yeah. Two seconds. Yeah. Anything else? I think it uh, deepens our faith and um, love for God. Perfect. Agree. Anything else on, from Zoom? What else? What, there's, it, it is really important when the church defines something as a dogma, right it's a revealed truth it's really important there's something there for us and the church tells us that dogmas are like lights okay so that's something that's going to show us a path uh, 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 both theologically and for our lives so anything else that anyone can think of why it might be important that um we understand that she's ever virgin well it's it's huge because it's never like she's a virgin she had a child it's a miracle it's n n never been done before um it's never been done after so it's like it's important it's huge cool <clears throat> I, I have a few things one is obviously mary is our heavenly mother so the more we get to know about her you know, the more we get to know about anybody we get closer to them so the more we can, and this is only one topic, of course, there's a lot of Marian dogmas, but the more we get to know Mary and why she lived a certain way, the closer that we can get to her. Um, it's definitely not about winning an argument. So taking today's information and bashing it over someone's head and saying, we're right, you're wrong, you're going to hell. That is not the purpose of really understanding the information at all. All right. Um, thirdly, sex is everywhere. 
Like, unless you want to live on a commune somewhere in the middle of nowhere off the grid, there's no way that any of us or our children or anyone can be completely sheltered from being exposed to it um, in today's world. Um, and I think, I hope after today's talk, you can see just how important this topic was to Mary. It wasn't that Mary just had a child and that child happened to be God and she then made a decision that it's, you know, I shouldn't have sex anymore. Mary made this decision before the angel appeared to her. And we'll get into all that later. But it was very important for her and it should be very important to us as a married couple, as people who are dating, single, whatever it may be. It applies differently to all of us, but the topic is very important. Can I just say, it yeah. was my assumption for a long time that yeah. Mary was a virgin yeah. until she conceived Jesus and then... Do you know, that was my understanding. It was just yeah, to we'll the point. The exact verse that says that she was a virgin until Jesus was born. And then we'll talk about yes. why it doesn't really mean that. But yeah, people, some people just don't know. I would assume a Catholic lecturer would know, but it may be his uh, mistake. Like, if you, the question is yeah. what happens in certain so-called Catholic universities, it's been going on for decades. Yeah. It is not new. It has been going on for decades. There are some seminaries that even have people in the so priests go to seminary to learn. There are even reports that this kind of things happen in some seminaries. It's not just Mariological stuff. There's also some Christological stuff. So things surrounding Christ um, that happen. Angie, you had a question? Yeah. So do some do some denominations actually believe that she wasn't, or is it just like all but Catholic? We'll get into that. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, that's going to come. We'll go through. I, I'll tell that. you what's really important about this dogma as well. All of the Marian dogmas point to Christ, they all point to Jesus. Okay, even this dogma points to Christ. Yeah, points to his miraculous birth, points to his divinity, points to his humanity but points to his life that he chose to, to live celibate. Christ was celibate his whole life, yeah? His mother chose that life as the spouse of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get into all hmm. of this later. So, we'll okay, sorry. All right. yeah. sorry, just to confirm, you went to ACU as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in that class, trust me. It wouldn't have been pretty. I went to ACU too as well. Right? Let's first focus on what, the, what does the church actually teach and what does it mean when it says Mary is the ever virgin? So we'll use the catechism, um, two articles. So the first is 499. It says the deepening of faith in the virginal motherhood led the church to confess Mary's real and perpetual virginity, even in the act of giving birth to the son of God made man. In fact, Christ's birth did not diminish his mother's virginal integrity, but sanctified it. And so the liturgy of the church celebrates Mary as a Parthenos or the Greek word for the ever virgin. And in 510, it's very clear. It says, Mary remained a virgin in conceiving her son, in giving birth to him, in carrying him, in nursing him at her breast, always a virgin. So even in the act, so I didn't know, even in the act of childbirth, Jesus did not diminish his mother's virginity. And the church fathers use the analogy of light passing through glass. So when the sun passes through glass or a window, it hits you, right? It doesn't break the glass in any way. And, you know, people say, oh, how is that possible that Jesus was a person? But we see lots of examples of Jesus doing things that God can do, such as walking through walls when he walked into the upper room and he just appeared before the, the apostles and their disciples. At, uh, on the road to Emmaus, he looked like someone completely different. And then he just, poof, he disappeared out of nowhere when he broke the bread. So he can do anything because he's God, right? So it's very clear, always a virgin her whole life. And... Let's now go back to the first council and trace back as far as we can to see the first ever mention of Mary being the ever virgin. So it was the second council of Constantinople in 553 AD. In the council, they say, if anyone will not confess that the word of God has two nativities. So now we know the council has nothing to do with Mary being the ever virgin. It's about Jesus being fully God and fully human. But we see that they mentioned Mary as the ever virgin and was made fresh flesh of the holy and glorious Mary, mother of God and ever virgin and was born from her. So they in no way define Mary being an ever virgin or what they mean by saying that, which means it's just globally accepted. Everybody knows Mary's the ever virgin. 
And in the early church, the only time they ever convened a council, because it was obviously very hard, there's no transportation. The bishops and the priests would all have to walk a very long time to meet. They would, and they really only did it when there was a lot of confusion in the community. So someone comes into your village or your town and says, Mary is not the mother of God, for example, or Jesus is not fully man and fully God. It's not until everyone starts to say, I'm a bit confused. I heard that priest say he was, but you're saying something different. I'm not really sure what the church teaches. They'll say, okay, we're going to get a council together. The council will focus on the nativity of Jesus. And this is, at the end of the council, the official teaching of the church. So everyone who gets confused can go to the teaching and say, the church says that Jesus is fully God and fully human. But we see here, they don't mention it. Or a, defin a definition or anything about Mary being the ever virgin. So it was globally accepted in 553 AD, at least that far back. We see, oh, wrong one. They also refer to her as the ever virgin again. If anyone declares that can be only in exactly and not truly said that the holy and glorious ever virgin Mary is the mother of God. So this council is also talking about Mary being defined as the mother of God. But still no mention of a definition. The earliest council that actually defines Mary being the ever virgin is the Lateran Council in 649 AD. So obviously at this point, there's some confusion. Doesn't mean everyone doesn't believe it, but someone's causing confusion. So they say, if anyone does not in accord with the Holy Fathers acknowledge the Holy and ever virgin and immaculate Mary was really and truly the mother of God inasmuch as she in the fullness of time and without seed, so conceived by the Holy Spirit, oh, which is exactly what they say, <laughs> God in the word himself, who before all time was born of God the Father, and now the important part, and without loss of integrity, brought him forth in her childbirth. And after his birth, preserved her virginity inviolate, let him be condemned. So this is not a, ah, oh, you can believe it if you want, it's not really important. It's let him be condemned. If you want to be Catholic, you have to believe that Mary was always a virgin. It's not up for, for discussion. And it became that, they had to make it that clear back then, that this is not something that you can disagree with. Okay, but that, so that's 649 AD. Let's see how far back we can trace the church or the members of the church actually believing it before it got to the point where they needed to have a council. So St. Leo the Great is 450. And there's a lot, I'm not going to say all their names. We're going to trace it back to as early as possible. St. Augustine, 428 AD. He's probably the most famous and well-known church father of all time. 392. Oh, no, disagreement. St. Ambrose is 388. <laughs> Uh, 386, so St. Jerome, again, huge, and we'll talk a lot about him tonight later on, 383. Um, St. Athanasius, again, very popular guy, we'll talk about him, 360. And Oregon, 248. And then we'll get to the Proto-Evangelium of James, so 120 AD. And that is the first and the earliest dated document in our church's history outside of Scripture. So there is no document that exists ever found dated earlier than that document. And this document tells us the name of Mary's parents. That's how we know her parents' names and other things about Mary. But so the earliest document ever found talks about Mary being the ever virgin. So we can trace it back all the way to the beginning. So let's look on the other side. How many people, and this is guys, I don't know, maybe 10 or whatever, but this is, there are dozens. I'll just pick the most popular ones because you might know them. Can I jump in? Yeah. Just to put this in perspective. Right in the 300s, you had this guy called Arius who brought into question whether Jesus was truly God. Yeah, the understanding that Mary was ever virgin doesn't come into question for 600 years. So, even Christ's divinity was more of an issue for people to decide over and above Mary's virginity. For the first 600 years, it never needed a noise, and for another thousand years after that. It never needed another word. Okay, so just so mm, I just wanted to make that good. point. This belief goes right back to the beginning, and obviously, after Saint John, uh, sorry, after Jesus leaves Mary with Saint John at the cross, yeah, she's with the disciples, so they know a lot about her. Yeah, they know what's going on. So she would have been speaking to them. John wrote the gospel. John wrote his letters. Yeah, this, just just put that picture in your mind. And on the other side, so we've got dozens throughout 450 years of history, right, who talk about this. On the other side, we have a few. So we have Tertullian. So he lived in and wrote in 180 AD. Says, doesn't say that Mary wasn't always a virgin, but he says it's not important. She maybe did it. It doesn't really matter. Tertullian ends up being a full-blown heretic. The fire, uh, he leaves the church, joins a heretical group, 
who thinks that their founder is the Holy Spirit incarnate. So it goes off the rails completely. Okay. Such a yeah. So he does it. He's very important in a lot of our the, the, the development of a lot of our theology. Yeah. Yeah. But he loses the plot towards the end of his life, and that's when he says the stuff about Mary. So complete heretic says it. Bishop Bonobus, 270 AD. Again, ends up being a complete heretic. Joins the Arians. Don't believe Jesus is better than man. He's not God. He's somewhere in the middle. Complete heretic. Okay. And lastly, and the last guy, Helvidius, 383 AD. Um, I won't talk about him now because he comes later in the talk. But for the first 400 years, three people say it. Two were complete heretics. And one guy is dealt with very swiftly by, yeah, <laughs> St. Jerome. Yeah. So you see dozens all the way down to the first document. And then we have pretty much heretics and people who don't really know how to analyze or, you know, look at the Bible and come up with teaching to be nice to him. All right. So the summary is she was a virgin prior to his birth, during his birth and after. Any questions on the Catholic teaching of Mary being the ever virgin? Online? Online? Anyone on Zoom? Look into the camera. Where is the camera? Anyone on Zoom? Any, <laughs> any, any questions? <coughs> okay. So, uh, by the way, for everyone on yeah. Zoom, I can see the chat. So if you want to write your question, I can let that in. Perfect. All right, so now we know what the church teaches. Let's look at why it doesn't teach it. Where does it get it from scripture? Because all the church's teachings are found in scripture. Okay. So there's three main things. There's the, the terms used engaged or betrothed. Um, Mary's vow, which is St. Augustine, who we just spoke about. He terms this teaching of Mary's vow. And finally, when Jesus is on the cross and says to Mary, this is, or to John, this is your mother, and, and the disciple, this is your son. So they're the three main things. All right, so... In Matthew 1.18, we read, Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So, two important things. One, obviously being engaged. They're saying engaged, not married. But Matthew puts in, but before they lived together. There's nothing in the Bible that just gets randomly put in. They're writing on papyrus. It's expensive. It takes time. It can get destroyed. But Matthew says it's important enough for him to write that they weren't living together. So, the term engaged in our modern world, what, what does it mean? How do you understand that term? Oh, as engaged now. now, what does it mean? Oh, it means that um, they're getting ready to be married. Like, he, yeah. he proposed to his girlfriend. Yeah. And, and what if they decide before the marriage, don't like you Nothing, anymore. yeah. You just separate, right? Yeah, you just there's separate. no formal. You're not actually you just, officially. There's, there's nothing, no, yeah, formal. nothing yeah. formal or nothing official. Correct. Yeah. Now, let's see if that... Um, understanding of the word engage, or it's also translated as, to, as betrothed, if that applied in the first century on Jesus' time. So obviously Jesus and Mary and Joseph are all Jews. So let's use a Jewish encyclopedia to see what that term means. So the term betrothal or engaged in Jewish law must not be understood in its modern sense. That is the agreement of a man and a woman to marry by which the parties are not, however, definitely bound, but which may be broken or dissolved without formal divorce. Betrothal or engagement such as this is not known either to the Bible or to the Talmud. And we see evidence in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel 3.14, which says, Then David sent messengers to Saul's son Ishbal, saying, Give me my wife, Michal, to whom I became betrothed. So he's saying his wife is also the one who he's betrothed to. It'd be like me saying, This is my wife, Sabel, who I am engaged to. Obviously, it doesn't make sense. So what does it actually mean then? The process of a wedding in the first century was... I'll use, let's use Mary and Joseph. So Mary and Joseph want to get married. The families would meet, obviously, the, they would accept each other, and then they would get engaged, which meant they would go to the temple, they would sign all the documents, and legally in Jewish law, they would be married. Okay? After that, Mary would go home with her parents. Joseph would then go and build a house for them to live in. He would then come back to Mary's parents' house, take her from the house to their new house, and they would consummate the marriage which would be the end of the formal process. So which is why Matthew wrote, but before they lived together. So they were legally married, and it's very important that we know they're legally married, and you'll see in the next section why. But they were legally married, but they hadn't yet consummated the marriage because they weren't living together. But people might say, I believe in the Bible alone. I don't care what the Jewish Encyclopedia says or any of this Catholic talk. If it's not in the Bible, I don't care. I don't believe it. 
So let's see if Jesus actually talks about this process of a marriage in the New Testament. But before that, let me ask you a question. How does Jesus describe his relationship with us? And he says it in many ways, but we'll focus on one. What are the different ways that he describes his relationship with us? Right in the bridegroom. Well, you just, let's not talk about the others. He talks about, in, in, a, in a marriage sense, he's our groom, we're his bride, and we're going to be back with him one day. Okay? So when Jesus is saying that, he's not saying that to us in 2022. He's saying it to people living in the time who know the way that Jews get married, which is you get married, you're getting betrothed, and then you go through the whole process. So let's see if Jesus, Jesus says anything about that process in the Bible. So in John 14, 2 to 3, Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I, told, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that you, so that where I am, there you may be also. 100%. There's no doubt that Jesus is talking about marriage, and there's no doubt that Mary and Joseph were married. But if it's still not clear enough, let's look at the exact next verse which starts with her husband, Joseph. As soon as they say engaged, the very next verse says her husband, Joseph. Okay. And more, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, plan to dismiss her quietly. When you read dismiss her quietly, what do you think, what do you think that means? They're like, put her on the side, like just not let anyone know, that kind of thing. Yeah, though she would be stoned if she was found to be a doctor, yeah. But that word... Yeah, so that word, which the Bible, was, the New Testament was written in Greek, is translated to divorce. So it's her husband. He was going to divorce her quietly, not just leave her, but that they had to get a divorce, even though they were only engaged. Um, in our minds, when we understand the term engaged, but they were married. It's very important that we understand that. Does everyone on Zoom and here completely believe they were married? Any doubts? Any questions? Questions? Anything? Because the next section is important. Okay, I just, I just, at what stage did they change this term, like engage to what we... Or is it still like... Do you know what I mean? I don't know what it's like right now for the Jewish people, or whether it still works this way, or when it changed for Western we, society. Um, sorry to interrupt. No, please go. We within the Maronite right, when someone gets engaged, we have a blessing that's called the right of betrothal. Oh. We take engagement very seriously. We, we went yeah. through it. We... Uh, that, yeah, like, you know. Engagement ring. Yeah, same with Giselle and I. Same with, yeah. You cannot dismiss her quietly. Yes. No, no. no. The, the whole point it about was, it is, but. It was a full yeah. betrothal. <clears throat> the priest came. The priest came to me and Josephine's um, engagement. He blessed, yeah, yeah. Same with me. He blessed yeah. the rings. And then we actually vowed. We had to we had to say vows like betrothal vows. Yeah. I'll send that's I'll send you all Maronite. That's the original Maronite, right? Of I can send you a video of when Giselle and I had the blessing. It's the same as like Giselle tripped out because she was like, "Did I just marry you?" And, I, <laughs> <laughs> and then that's what my wife now, said. Now, she the, goes, "Are we married now?" Like, <laughs> it's, it's important to note that we are not implicating that betrothal is then sacramental. There's a difference between the two. But we, we, we take the control of that history. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's building off that Jewish kind of understanding. So it's not as if we've never let go of it, but because of Christ being the fulfillment of the law, he now brings about, which is what we call sacramental grace, which is just a different level altogether. Yeah. All right. I just, hey, Fadi, I was just going to add to that. Like yeah. also, you know, in Arabic we say, like before I gave the ring to a missus, bro, I said my, my parents had to go to her parents' house. Like it was a massive thing. It wasn't just me on my own. On my own. Um, it's pretty much like I was marrying the whole family before I even got married. For us Middle Easterners, yeah. that's how it is, yeah. It's appropriate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, awesome. So, which leads us into Mary's Vow. So St. Augustine put this teaching together, titled Mary's Vow, and, and it goes off the fact that Mary and Joseph were completely married before the angel appeared to Mary. Not after. And so we read in Luke... 1 30 to 31 the angel says do not be afraid mary for you have found favor with god and behold you will so future tense conceive in your womb and bear a son and you name him jesus all right I'm gonna, can i ask you one question excellent so we get married we are at saint pat's church in Parramatta. 
we have the ceremony, we're completely married. We go to our reception, and an angel appears to you and says, Sabel, great news, you're going to have a son. What would your reaction be? We're married. We're at the reception now. Somebody put something in the alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I would be shocked. Yeah, but how would you like take the news that you're going to have a child? I'd probably think I was drunk. And <laughs> like in the future, tense. you're a married woman and you're going to have a child in the future. Yeah, but don't, yeah, all right. How would you feel? That I'm going to have yeah. a child? I'd probably be like, yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, that's why people get married. It's great. Thank you. Like, you'd be happy. Oh, right? Yeah. And angel, you're now a married woman and angel says you're going to have a baby. Yeah. You're like, oh. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, there's no time for it. The angel says nothing to Mary about happening right there in the spot. Nothing. But what does Mary respond? How can this be? For I do not know man. Yes. Mary's married. The angel says to her, You're going to have a child. And she goes, How? I don't know. I've never had sex. This is what's called Mary's vow. So we believe that Mary took a vow of virginity before the angel appeared to her. For the rest of her life. That she was never ever going to have sex. Ever. She was a consecrated woman. Who devoted her life to God. So why did Joseph kill Yes. Perfect. Let Fadi explain. So there's, there's two different thoughts. And there's evidence for both. One is. So a, a first century uh, Jewish writer. Josephus. Talks about uh, consecrated women. Who get married to men for this reason. So if you if you get to 50 years old in the first century, like you're very lucky. No one lived past 40 or 50. And so there's women who consecrated their lives to God. They had no way of making money. So their dad is, has passed away or is going to pass away. They need someone to look after them. It's not like there's a church where the nuns sleep and people pay for everything. It didn't exist. So what would happen is normally the consecrated women would marry a man whose wife has passed away. So he needs to work, yeah. right? But he needs someone to look after his children. She needs someone to provide for her, but she never wants to have any more ch any children. And so it's like an understanding. We're going to get married because we're going to live together, but there's there's no sex ever. And Rodney, can you give you the example about the Essenes? Of, there's another re yeah. another way too. Well, before we jump into the Essenes, so the other thing is for protection. I mean, it's not yeah. like there's like security and <coughs> police like force. They live in the hill country, right? Any marauders, any thieves come in, they'll rape, pillage, whatever. So the men were there for protection as well. Yep. Okay, so a, a woman on her own in the first century, recipe for disaster. She's finished. It's not going to happen. So there was also, you mentioned the Essenes. So there was, in, in first century um, Judah, there was like, we hear about the Pharisees, we hear about the Sadducees. There was a group called the Essenes, okay? They separated themselves from the standard Jewish nation because they said, all you Pharisees and Sadducees and that, you guys are off the rails. You're not even following the law properly anymore. And so they separated themselves. They knew the Messiah was coming. And so they separated themselves and lived in their own community and they took vows of virginity. All of them, right? Now, there were some of them that they recruited into the Essenes that could live with the community, that were uh, were there to have children, just to help populate the Essene community. But they thought it's pretty much imminent the Messiah is coming, which Jesus was anyway. Um, and so they used to have men, Essene men, who would um, take care. They were they, they had a vow of virginity, and the women had the vow of virginity, and they pair them up together, obviously for that security, the protection, and um, to sustain each other. Yeah. Perfect. Are you saying that Joseph might have been an SC? Is that what you yes. could have possibly we, been? Yes. Like? The, the truth of the matter is we don't know. Um, it could have been it could have been SC. There is another um, uh, old tradition as well that uh, Joseph was quite old and he was widowed. Um, and so he then also took um, Mary as a wife, basically as her protector. Okay, so he knew she had already had the vow of virginity. So either way, there's a couple of different ways to cut that apple. Mm. What do we know? We don't know because the scriptures are silent on, on exactly which way it is. What we do know is that we're together. She was a virgin. Off yeah. go. Definitely married. No kids. And so St. Augustine says, because she made a vow of virginity and her husband did not have to be the thief of her modesty, instead his guardian. Had she intended to no man, 
she would not have been amazed. Her amazement is a sign of the vow. And Saint Gregory, I love what he says. What is Mary's response? Listen to the voice of the pure angel. The angel brings the glad tidings of childbearing, but she is concerned with virginity and holds that her integrity should come before the angelic message. She doesn't refuse to believe the angel, neither does she move away from her convictions. So in other words, she's like standing up to the angel. She's like, what are you talking about? I've taken a vow. And even if you angel are going to tell me to have sex, I'm, I'm never going to do it. So how can I possibly have a child? And if we think just a few months before, Zachariah and Elizabeth, the angel, same thing happens. Zachariah appears to, the angel appears to Zachariah and says, your wife is going to have a child. He goes, how can this be? She's old and she's barren. The angel says, boom, you can't speak because of your lack of faith until the baby's born. For Mary, it doesn't punish Mary at all. Why? Because in the Old Testament, there's, it's happened before. God went to Abraham and said, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a baby. And Sarah was old and she was barren. So why did Zachariah not have any faith? God's done it before. But God has never made a virgin who is never, ever going to have sex, have a baby. So that's why Mary doesn't get punished, but Zachariah does. So she's kind of stood up to an angel. It's pretty tough for a teenager. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, any questions on Mary's vow before we go on to the next one? No. <laughs> this is your mother. Okay, Jesus on the cross. Right, we, we know the story. So on John 19, 26 to 27, it says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So right after this, we're going we're gonna to see four apparent brothers of Jesus. And he says he had sisters too. So if Jesus, if Mary and Joseph had four other sons and lots of other sisters, why would Jesus on the cross publicly disgrace his mum and his whole family by saying, there was a lot of people there, the Romans, the Jews, there were a lot of people there watching Jesus. And publicly he says, Mary, you're going now with John. He's my mate, he's my apostle, he's my disciple. Met him three years ago, but you're going to live with him forever. How? How could... Oh well, it sounds crazy. <laughs> How would Jesus, as we know, not honor his father and his mother? Disgracing her in front of everybody, saying, your, your children are not worthy to look after you anymore. Oh. Wow. And St. Athanasius, who remember we spoke about in the fourth century, he says, for if she had other children... The Savior would not have ignored them and entrusted his mother to someone else, nor would she have become someone else's mother. She would not have abandoned her own to live with others, knowing well that ill becomes a woman to abandon her husband or her children. Okay. This to me was like one of the biggest ones. Like, how, like, what's the argument against this? So I was looking at a few debates, and the main argument, well, the only argument was, in, before Jesus is crucified, he says his brothers called him crazy, right? They didn't believe him. And so Jesus wanted Mary to be with a believer. So he didn't want her to be with a non-believer. But we're talking about Jesus, who's God and knows everything, knowing right after he dies, the brothers who call him crazy are all going to die for him. So is he going to disgrace his brothers who are all about to die for him? Is that the God like we know? No, it can't be. He would never do it. Never. Questions. So that, that, that's the basis of why the church teaches Mary was always a virgin. Any questions before we go to the arguments? Is there like a different definition of what brother means? Like, yeah, we'll get into that. We, yes, later oh, on. Okay. Yes. This is yeah. probably like back before. That's okay. But did Joseph divorce Mary? No. no. Oh. He said, the angel appeared to him and he said he planned to divorce oh, her. Did. But then the angel appears again and he, they stay oh, together. Okay. So, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> no, they didn't get a divorce. <laughs> Anyone on Zoom? Because we're about to move into the, the next section. No? Okay. Excellent. All right. So now let's look at the arguments. What are the arguments used against the church? We'll go back to our mate, Helvidius. That's not really him because no one knows what someone looked like in the third or fourth century. But I thought that looks like he's an angry guy. Mary wasn't a virgin. I thought that was <laughs> something like him. You didn't mention it. No one knows that's my old video. I'm just trying to look at him. It's actually not him. It's not him to know. This could be, who knows? This guy could be a good guy. I don't know. But I'll just use his photo. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about it, a fourth century heretic. Hold on. The first move. Oh my God. I really think that's him. The older guy. The homeless guy. No, no, no. Not the homeless guy. The neighbor. The neighbor that they think is a 
serial killer. He ends up being the Nazi's blog. Is that actually him? Yes. Yeah. Is that him? Oh, okay. Oh, Crap. <laughs> I'm sure he's a great guy. Just to, all right. <laughs> and Saint Jerome, who you know, today if if people have disagreements, they're very nice to each other. We don't like to upset anybody. In the fourth century, that wasn't the case. Saint Jerome just tore Helvidius to shreds. He called him every name under the sun. Said it's like debating a child. Like you have no idea what you're talking about. But for the sake of the community, I'll respond. But, but what actually happened, so the scene is, in those times, if you want to like communicate something, you'd go to what's called the town center. So there's the market, people buy food and spices and stuff. And you'd walk up the steps to the, like the high point and everyone's like, oh, this guy wants to say something. And then you would say whatever you want. And if you could write, you would like put a document on the wall and to say, this is what I believe. Saint Jerome lives in the same area and he hears about what's happened. So he goes down, he gets the document and he says, okay, I'm going to write a book. This is a 1,600-year-old document. Not actually. It's not papyrus. No, no, no. He writes this. St. Jerome writes this against Helvidius. To say, okay, you raised these points. Here's my response to all of them. And it's, yeah. What, what the, year is this happening? So it's uh, 380, so late third, fourth century, early fifth century. So very, very long time ago. It doesn't need many pages. Hey, it's small. It's small writing. You can pass it around. But um, just want to confirm though. So Helvidius's arguments are the exact arguments you're going to run into today. There's nothing new. No new arguments have come up in 1600 years. Saint Jerome's argument and everything I'm about to say, I did not make any of it. This is all Saint Jerome, and it's been the, the church's response for 1600 years. So there's nothing new at all about this debate. Oh God, it's still going. It's still going, and we keep saying the same thing, and they keep saying the same thing. And we, are, we provide the same answers we're going to go through now. Mate. Well, you'll see it's not very, his arguments aren't very great. But anyway, okay. <clears throat> the first thing is, which is what you raised earlier, around the point of until. In Matthew 1, 24, 25, he writes, When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, no divorce, had, but had no marital relations with her until... She bought a son and named him Jesus. So if you just open the Bible and you read that, what do you think? Like, oh, yeah. oh, they definitely did it after. Did it after. Yeah, they did it. Matthew Covini says, have a look. He's, Matthew's saying they did it after Jesus was born. Okay, so what's, what, what Helvidius is doing is creating what's called a principle. So he's saying when the word until appears, that means something has to change. So Mary was a virgin until an event, and then it had to change and she was no longer a virgin. So it's very dangerous to do that in just one verse. You have to say, okay, let's find where the word until, let's find where it is, sorry, in other parts of the Bible, and see, does the same thing happen? Whenever it appears and an event happened, does it change? Okay. In 1 Timothy, he says, until I arrive, so Timothy is saying, until I come, Saint give, Paul. sorry, St. Paul to Timothy, until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting and to teaching. So do we think St. Paul here is saying to Timothy, Keep teaching them until I come. But when I come, no one's allowed to talk about scripture. No, no. When I'm here, no talking. I, I'm the only one who talks. Do we think St. Paul would say that? No. In 1 Corinthians, for he, Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. When he conquers all his enemies, is Jesus no longer reigning? Oh, so he retired. Can you see how why he, he, St. Jerome smashes him? These are the verses he's using. Yeah. So you know how each scripture is written by a different scribal, etc. And the mm -hmm. grammar's different. Like, would that You've got to take it in context, but yes. what Helvidius is saying is because the word's there, it means it has to mean this. Well, no, it doesn't. Same word in the Greek. Yeah, okay. doesn't. And my, my favorite one, in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, I've commanded you, and remember, I'm with you always until the end of the age. Sorry, guys, Jesus is not in heaven. Because at the end of the age, he's gone. So... Mm. We'll get one more slide, then I'll say that. I want to introduce you to a guy called Martin Luther. Anyone know who he is? Started the, he started the Protestant Reformation, right? So, for those who don't know what that is, in the 15th, 16th century, there was only like there was the Catholic Church, there was the Orthodox Church, and then they decided to say, you know what, we don't, we don't believe in what one of these guys are teaching, we're going to leave a group of them and we're going to start our own church and only teach the truth and only refer to scripture 
We didn't care about history. We didn't care about church fathers. If it's not in the Bible, we, we didn't care about it. So that was their core belief. He says, right, and this is the guy who all the churches have now, there's 40,000 of them. They started with these guys, okay? All the guys who now don't believe it. He says, their founder, when Matthew says that Joseph did not know Mary carnally until she had brought forth her son, it doesn't follow that he knew her subsequently. On the contrary, it means that he never knew her. This babble is without justification. He's talking about Helvidius. Helvidius has neither noticed nor paid any attention to either scripture or the common idiom. He hasn't gone through the process of checking where that word appears everywhere else or checked how the Jews write. He just took one passage and said, oh, yeah. the founder of the Protestant church and the founders believed that Mary was always a virgin. And Matthew 1, 25 doesn't mean that they had sex. Okay, can I jump in? Please. So <clears throat> Luther, the other reformers, Zwingli, or so-called reformers, Calvin, they, they're happy to bag the church. They're happy to bag the councils. They're happy to bag the priests, the bishop, the pope. None of them will touch the Blessed Virgin Mary. There would have been an uproar. They would have had shreds torn off them. But and they knew it. No, no. That's a different. Well, that was prayer. Praying to the saints is different. But the Blessed Virgin Mary, ever Virgin Mother of God, no one touched it. No one went. No one dared to until. 300 years later, they're, they're the clouds that followed these blokes over. Sorry. The, the it took 300 years. Over. The Protestant church, even though they kept dividing and dividing and dividing. 300 years, they all believed it. It wasn't until the last couple hundred years, or really 150 years, where it started to become mainstream Protestant belief that Mary wasn't a virgin. So we go back to 120, and thousands of people, they have 150 years of history. Okay. Buddy, sorry. Yeah. Do you keep building on that point? The until, or are you done with it? That is the last one of them. Because I think there's an important Greek thing to go for. Yeah, go for it. Um, in the Greek language, words aren't just past, present, future. They could also mean endless. We have no English word that means until with no definitive end. Yeah. So we just say until. But the Greeks meant until with no definitive end whatsoever. And it's beautiful when you think about it because they leave room for God to come in and impose a different will. That's how really? good the Greeks were. And it just shows how much we suck, but we get yeah. to that sometimes. English, <laughs> and to answer your question. That's my question. No, that's what the intention was. That's one, what's one way. Uh, and this, the most important thing is what, is actually, what did Matthew actually mean when he wrote it? Yeah. So Matthew is in, in the book of Isaiah, he's talking about he, a prophecy. So there's 300 plus prophecies, okay, of the Messiah. One of them is that he would be born from a virgin yes. okay matthew is saying very it's obvious that mary is the fulfillment of that prophecy mary is the virgin who gave birth to a son so matthew had no idea if mary had sex after that uh, jesus was born he's saying up until jesus was born because that's all the prophecy talks about mm -hmm. the virgin gave birth to the savior that's, that's what he's talking about that's why he's used the word until because he had to he had to say until because what happens later doesn't really matter to him. The prophecy is the virgin gave birth. Yes. Matthew never talks about Mary's sex life before or after. He doesn't care. <laughs> He's not going to throw in a sex a sentence and then just move on to something else. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Weird. I told you he said sex a lot. Any other questions on until? Clear that Helvidius has no idea what he's talking about. Okay. He has neither paid any attention. The other one, the big one, is the brothers of Jesus. There's movies, there's books, there's everything about the theory that Jesus had brothers, okay? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> brothers, please enter. <clears throat> yes, Rodney's going to write. So this could get confusing. So Rodney's going to write as I talk, okay? I'm going to write on the board because visual is sometimes easy to... Hmm. He's going to zoom in on the. Yep, for everyone on Zoom, I am zooming in on the whiteboard as we speak. All right. So the that passage. Is spot on, my friend. Thank you. The passage that Helvidius uses to say, look, Mary had other children, is. Well, not just Helvidius, everyone today. Yeah, well, it started with him. Yeah, but that's the, what he put up on the board, right? Okay, so when Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. He came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, 
Where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? So the, write, the write the names of the, son, of the brothers. James, <clears throat> James Joseph, Joseph, Simon, Simon and Judas. So this word brothers means blood brother. In, in the translation, it means blood brother. So Helvius is saying, look, Matthew is saying blood brother. So obviously they're his brothers. And if you just looked at that, you would say, yeah, probably. But again, we've got to use the principle. Let's look at it in other places in the Bible. So in Genesis 13, 8, we said then Abram, who becomes Abraham, said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herders and my herders, for we are kindred. Kindred translates in Hebrew to ach or achi, brother, blood brother. So for those who know who Abraham is, what is Abraham's relationship to Lot? Does anyone know? Oh, who knows? Someone Call knows it out. Sure. Someone online. You would know. Abraham and Lot. His Someone cousin. Knows? His cousin? No. Wait, was that the son of the other, the, the, um, the slave that had the son? No. No. <laughs> no. It's Ishmael. It, so, Lot is Abraham's nephew. It's in the Bible everywhere. Okay. Calls him his nephew all the time. So why does Abram say to Lot, you're my brother? Because of all Middle Easterns do. Imagine someone found my phone in a thousand years. It would be like I had 5,000 brothers and cousins. Everyone's brother. Every, we don't distinguish between brother or cousins. And they're, they're Middle Easterners. This is how we speak. It was an idiom. Yeah, it's just, that's how they spoke. And so we have evidence in the Old Testament, in the Bible, of brother not meaning brother. But it doesn't mean that they definitely weren't his brothers. It just means that that verse doesn't prove they're his brothers, but it doesn't mean they're definitely not. So let's try and figure out who these four gentlemen are. All right. So at the, at the cross in Matthew 27, 55, it says, okay. Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And sorry, Mary, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. So we know that James and Joseph, the brothers of Jesus, their mom's name is Mary. Okay. And there was another, uh, uh, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, but they don't name her. So we're not going to put her name on the board. So, so far we have. So far we've got Mary. two women there, two Marys. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And this is at where? This is at the cross. Yes. Okay, so that's it in verse 55. If we just go five verses later, in verse 60, he says, so Joseph of Arimathea, so not Joseph, Jesus' father, the Joseph who gives Jesus his tomb, took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, when he had hewn, which he had hewn in the rock, and then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. So Mary Magdalene, still there, and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. This one's called the other Mary. Do we think Matthew, who every single time he calls, he references Mary in his gospel, says the mother of the Lord, the mother of Seth, the mother of Jesus, he's going to call her uh, the other Mary. She's, <laughs> she's the other one. So the other Mary is the mother of James and Joseph so far. Yes. Correct. Right. Yeah, but again, also, sorry, sorry no, sorry, Fatty. He's also put her second in the um, second after Mary Magdalene. Very good yeah. point. Yeah. So it's important to know Mary Magdalene was there, but she's mentioned before, which means she's more important in Jewish times. All right. But it doesn't definitely mean it's not Mary's mother of God. It's pretty obvious, but it doesn't definitely mean. So but we'll keep, keep, going. keep going. So in Galatians, it says, Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Kephas or Peter and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. So we know that James is the apostle James. Not just the random guy called James. It's the apostle James. And then in Luke, in Luke 6, and when day came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, whom he named apostles. Simon, who he called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, and Philip, and Bartholo Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus. So we now know that James, the apostle, his dad's name is Alphaeus, oh, so not Joseph. Yeah, married to he's married to the other Mary. And just for this other Mary... She's a very devout believer, obviously. She's at the cross. She's brought her, her life on the line because they were killing followers of Jesus. She was at the cross. 
So she's not like, oh, whatever, but she wasn't important enough in the context of the message where the readers had to know who she exactly was. But she's obviously, she's a very devout follower. Okay, so Mary, the other Mary, she's married to Alpheus, not Joseph. Keep going. John 19, 25. Meanwhile, standing, and John's at the cross. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, so Mary's there, we know now, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So two things. One is sister is translated to blood sister. So do we think Mary's parents named both her daughters, both their daughters, Mary? No. So at the what? cross at the moment, we have the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Yeah. Okay. So New Testament evidence that blood sister doesn't mean blood sister. Always. Okay. Evidence there. But why is everyone called Mary? First thing is, it can't, in my mind, it proves the Bible's true because who's going to make up a story and call all the women Mary? Yeah. Like they give, they'll give them different names. Surely, surely, ah, oh, we can't be bothered. Just Mary, Mary, Mary. No. The second thing is, he says Mary is the wife of Clopas, but that says Mary is the wife of Alpheus. So, what is the Hebrew translation of Alpheus? Clopas. So Mary is married to Clopas, and they have two sons so far, James and Joseph, accounted for. Well, we'll keep going. But it's kind of enough. Let's keep going. So in Mark 15, 40, it says there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger. James the Younger is the Apostle James. So we know it's definitely that James, whose mother's Mary, the other Mary, is the Apostle James. So there's more. We are Catholic, so we don't just have the Bible. But even if we had the Bible alone, that's obviously enough, right? But thank God we have 2,000 years of tradition. So it was illegal to be a Christian for the first 300 odd years, punishable by death. So no one really wrote anything because if they came into your house and they found some kind of Christian writing, that would kill you and your whole family. It would. And so when Constantine, hey, they, they would. And so when Constantine becomes emperor, Okay, he makes Christianity what they call tolerable. So it's not illegal, and you can't kill them for being Christians, but it's also not the official religion of Rome, but it's tolerable, which means now they can write things down. And so one of the guys who worked for him was a guy called Eusebius. He's regarded as a, the, the church historian, and he said, just so we don't forget what's happened in the last 300 years, let's, I'm going to write everything that happened that's been passed on to me by word of mouth. He's not trying to debate or saying... By this, barely anyone's saying that Mary's not a virgin. So he's just writing down history so it's never forgotten. So let's see what he says. In book 4, paragraph 22. So after James the Just, or James the Younger, had suffered martyrdom for the same reason as the Lord, Simeon, or Simon, let's add Simon, his cousin. So now we're in the 4th century. Cousin exists as a word. It didn't exist in the 1st century. So the specific word cousin is now created. And Eusebius says, Simon, his cousin, who's the son of Popus was appointed bishop, who they all proposed because he was another cousin of the Lord. Mm. Yeah. There's one more thing, and I love this one. He also writes, they all took, a bit, bit repetitive in the beginning, they all took counsel together as to whom they ought to judge worthy to succeed James, and all decided that Simon, the son of Clopas, whom the scripture of the gospel also mentions, was worthy of the throne of the diocese there. Now, he was, so it is said, a cousin of the Savior. For Hegesippus, who's another church historian, related that Clopas was the brother of Joseph. Oh. So we have two brothers marrying two women who call themselves sisters. They're so close. Either they're, they're cousins or very close friends. Marrying each other. And they were kids. And so, of course, they're going to be called the brothers of Jesus. They're, they're practically cousins, but... There's no, there's no word cousin back then, but there's brothers. Wait, okay, so the other Mary and Mary and the Blessed Virgin Mary are sister-in-laws. Correct. They could, they could be sister-in-laws. They could be cousins. They could be very close. Most likely sister-in-law. But like you, you can never say it's one hundred percent so. But they were obviously very close. But we know that Clopas and Joseph were brothers. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sister in law after the marriage, I yeah, thought, yeah. yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, no, not before. Yeah, yes, yes. 
So is that clear enough? When we add history and we add scripture and everything, is there any doubt that they're not? We can't account for Judas. That name is only one we can't find evidence for. But three of the four are obviously the sons of Clopas and Mary. But so can I also say, mm. just to go back to the other, we don't have to go back to the other side, but yeah. who was the one saying, is this not the brothers of Jesus? The people. The people. The people yeah, around who we're talking to. Anyway, like it has question marks next to it so it's not it's not like jesus is saying this is my brothers anyway no, yeah. so it's not like it's because jesus is doing miracles him. right yeah and they're saying but this is just jesus exactly. they're his brothers yeah. how how does he do all these things saying, yeah it's not like so this is jesus brothers, brothers. correct question mark? Like, yeah and his sisters but they don't name them why that it's like not yeah. really the problem is when you read scripture you can't Read it out of context. You can't just take that cursory look, read it in English about, you know, like like we said, engaged, right? We are talking about engaged before. You can't just read it, apply your understanding to it, and boom, you've worked it all out because you fall into that trap. That's what fundamentalists do. That's why you yeah. have so many people who go, no, no, you know, the clip you saw before, right? Oh, sh sh yeah, Mary definitely had, uh, had other children. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Who? Man, we've worked this stuff out hundreds, some of them more. 1600 years ago. 1600 years ago, right? It's done. It's settled. Work it out. Read the scripture. Take the context. Bring it back. So we're always allowing ourselves to read the scriptures through the people who, through the, the lens that gave us the script. The church gave us the scriptures. The scriptures are a product of the church. So who better to help us understand the scriptures than through the church? Does it make sense? But do you see how when we read that that first thing, it was like, well, if you just read that, yeah, and you go, oh, this is the word of God, and it's absolutely true and everything. Well, it is the word of God, and it is absolutely true, but you've misconstrued it. You've missed it. You missed the point. You missed the context, yeah? Yeah. So after the argument, and um, the church has proved that through this. After you asked the book, yeah. We never hear a response from Elvidius. Never found. <laughs> he gets buried. Doesn't mean he never responded, but there's no evidence found in history that he ever responded. Yeah. But he had like three lines and St. Jerome just yeah. absolutely yeah. tore shreds off him. There's yeah. the book. Yeah. The fact is that survived 1600 years and Helvidius was never heard of again. Yeah. 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 And so, going back to your, oh, sorry, sorry yeah. buddy. So the next time I'm hanging out with my brothers, having a gile, I have to be be sure to say. Uh, you Rodney, don't have any, so you can't do that. Rodney's son of Ethab and Daddy's <laughs> son of. Just in case, just in case. All right. And even call me your cousin. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll just go back to Luther again on this topic of the brothers of Jesus. He says Christ was the only son of Mary, and the Virgin Mary bore no children besides him. I'm inclined to agree with those who declare that brothers really means cousins for holy writ scriptures and the Jews always call cousins brothers, just like all of us. And under the word brethren, the Hebrews include all cousins and other relations, whatever may be the degree of affinity. So that's Luther, that's Luther 1100 years later, who believes pretty much what we believe today on this topic. And just to wrap this session up, the catechism Article 500 says, against this doctrine, the objection is sometimes raised that the Bible mentions brothers and sisters of Jesus. The church has always understood these passages as not referring to other children of the Virgin Mary. In fact, James and Joseph, brothers of Jesus, are the sons of another Mary, a disciple of Christ whom St. Matthew significantly calls the other Mary. They are close relations of Jesus, according to an Old Testament expression. They are by Clopas and Joseph and all these things. Thank Questions? You the Thank you, the so there you go. None of these news has been around for 1600 years. The exact argument. Yeah. Wow. Any questions on that? And then there's just one final thing. Oh, surely is one. Fatty. Yes. Yes, Fatty. Uh, how are you, Fatty? All right? <laughs> how are you? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not really a question, but if you think about it properly, mm -hmm. uh, say, look, look, Listen, what we say, like uh, we are brothers and sisters in, in Christ, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, and if you look to other religion, not, I'm not talking about domination. Take Islam, for example. Why they call each other brothers, 
sisters. Same thing, yeah. They're using exactly what the Jews used to use before. Yeah. We're growing up in Western culture, which doesn't speech, normally do this. Speech. That's yeah. an idiom. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a language. And language changes over the centuries, and different languages have different idioms. And like Freddie said, you know, 10,000 years from now, they pick up Freddie's phone and they're going to laugh because, like, this guy had. He related to everyone. He had, he had brothers with everybody, right? Text messages. <laughs> Hi, brother. Hey, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, but that's why they do. They, 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 yeah. they call each other brothers. Agree. All right. So there's one final thing, which it's not scriptural, it's not historical, but it's scientific. Okay. And it goes back. And first, before I get into this, I was at Our Lady of Lebanon and Father Yuhanna Khalifi was doing mass. And he was talking about this topic of Mary being a perpetual virgin. And he said, whenever, when other denominations, denominations say to him, you know, how, what, how do you believe this? He goes, I'm a priest. Okay. I've never met Jesus. I never conceived him, never breastfed him, never changed his nappy, never helped him as a child, never saw his miracles, never saw him die, resurrect, ascend, nothing. And I'm never going to have sex in my whole life. He goes, all the nuns and the priests are the same. We, no, none of us have met him. So if we, acting by a faith, which is the gift from God, can devote our whole lives to Jesus and take that, you know, and, and be celibate for our whole lives, how much more was Mary who saw all of it. How could she possibly, after seeing all of that, say, I don't feel fulfilled. I want to have a normal relationship with Joseph or I want more children. Like, how? She can't. If Monsignor can do it, Mary doesn't need any more to do it. She, and, and don't forget, she was the spouse of the bride of the Holy Spirit. She was the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Like, take, yeah. So then take into context that she was the spouse of the Holy Spirit. That's it. You, you ain't gonna she had her spouse. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And, and the Lord of the Father. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> Let it be done with me, what is word. And mother of the Savior. <laughs> That's like, That's yeah. she need any other you 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 <laughs> who Jesus is. Yeah. Confirms all of that. What, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is not what fetal microchimerism is. Oh, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I was going to try and explain it, but Rodney's the scientist. So, Rodney, can you just explain what chimerism means? Oh, uh, okay. This is no, no, it's, it's not a scientific term. Actually, it's a mythological term. And it was, if you know you like your uh, ancient Roman mythology, um, uh, a chimera was something like the Minotaur, so half bull um, and half man. So any time that you have two different species that come together and procreate, they produce uh, a, a separate, you know, like a joint yeah, between the two species. Okay. So that's okay. where the actual term comes. Yeah. And so if we keep that context in mind of Mary and her relationship with the Trinity, in the 1960s, uh, scientists and doctors were studying the human body and they'll, they want to study women, women who had injuries on their body and how their body would fight the disease or the injury, whatever it may be. So they had a woman who had a shoulder injury. So they went in there, they took a few things out, they were studying them and they found for the first time ever, cells of another person in that woman, in her shoulder, kind of fighting the disease. And they said, well, what, how could this be? A person can't have someone else's cells in them. So the guy goes, let's get more women. Let's see if it's more widespread. So they got a lot of other women. There was knee injuries, stomach injuries, diseases, everything. All the women had cells of other people in their body in the parts of the body that were fighting the disease other people's cells then other dna other dna yeah yeah and so they put a questionnaire together like this doesn't make sense let them answer all these questions we'll try to find a pattern and so one pattern they found was a lot of them said they were mothers so they said oh okay not all of them a lot of them said they were mothers so they said, okay, that explains that group, 80%. They got the other 20 in and said, well, are you sure? You've never been a mother. Like, it doesn't make any other sense. And most of them said, well, I didn't have a child, but I had a miscarriage. So the cells were in the women who had a miscarriage. And there were also some women who said, never a miscarriage, never um, had a child. And it actually delayed the study by a few years because they finally came out and said, I had an abortion. So the women who had abortions, the, the, the babies who died 
their cells were still in their mum and fighting for the mother. That's their purpose, to fight for the mother. And one of the women was 94. So it was like forever. The cells don't leave. And they found that it was in the connection between the umbilical cord of the mother feeding the child and the child was giving back. And if we keep that context of what we're saying before in mind, how much more, like we receive the Eucharist. It's amazing. Okay. But we believe the Eucharist is Jesus physically in us until it, the host dissolves. Right. Once it's, it's dissolved in, in the stomach, Jesus is no longer physically present in, in us. Spiritually he is definitely, but not physically. Mary had Jesus in her body from the moment of conception until the moment she left earth. 24-7 in her body. And we're not finished. In her body fighting for her. But what else did they find? That the mother's cells were in the children. Fighting when the children had disease. And so Mary's cells were in Jesus. He never got sick or sinned, but her cells were in his body. And they had this amazing connection where they were both always fighting for each other. When Jesus was in her womb and after he ascended into heaven, his cells were still in her. And which takes us to a different topic, but of course Mary is going to be assumed into heaven. How can Jesus' cells lose to any disease? How can it lose to age? How can Mary ever die? She can't. Because his cells are in her fighting all the time. So... It's just like, it's amazing. It's not scriptural or historical, but it's, there's no doubt that Mary never had a want or a need in her whole life. She had Jesus in her all the time, 24 seven. She didn't need children. She didn't need to have sex with Joseph or any, anything to do like that. To her, Jesus, God was in her all the time and needed nothing else. Fullness of life. Yeah. Full, of grace. full of grace to the full, to the maximum. That's why when we say sometimes, you know, like, and the litanies and things like the, the twin hearts of Jesus and Mary. That's actually like scientifically yeah. what was happening, yeah? yeah. It is. All right. It is. Any Amazing. questions before final prayer? <laughs> Peeps on the, on the Zoom? <laughs> Nothing. Let's have a prayer. Let's be <laughs> <laughs> Brothers and sisters, any, Brothers any... <laughs> Mons, do you want to leave? Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To Thee do we cry, poor banished children of Thee. To Thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious Advocate, Thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this our exile, Show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you, guys.